Good evening, everyone. My name is Stephanie Bishke, and I am the event specialist at the Rutgers University Alumni Association. I thank you all for being with us today. Today, I'm pleased to welcome you to Polling 101, the science, the art, and a look at the 2020 presidential election with Dr. Ashley Koning. This evening will be moderated by Gabriel Soto, the Director of Research at Edison Research. Here, he is the primary architect and co-presenter of the first comprehensive report on the US Latino podcast audience called the Latino Podcast Listener Report and works closely with clients such as Apple, ESPN, NPR, Univision, and other key players in the media and audio space. Gabriel is a, is a graduate of Rutgers University, and he attributes much of his success to the priceless experience he gained working as an interviewer, supervisor, and manager at the Rutgers Eagleton Center for Public Interest Polling as a student. A few housekeeping notes before we begin. If you have any questions for our presenter, please submit them in the Q&A box you'll find on your screen. Um, we are going to do our best to accommodate as many questions as possible, but I just want to warn everyone that we do have a hard ending for this evening's webinar because after her conversation with the RUAA, Ashley is going to be going for an interview with the BBC. So we can't blame her for leaving us tonight on time. For your convenience, this presentation is being recorded and will be uploaded to the Rutgers Alumni YouTube channel. Following this presentation, you will receive an email with a link to that channel. It's now my pleasure to turn it over to Gabriel. Thank you, Stephanie. Hello, everyone. My name is Gabriel Soto, and I, today I have the honor of introducing you to someone very special in my life. You know, this person, you can say, really sparked my career <clears throat> when I was a, lo a lost college student getting ready to start this crazy thing called adulting. Do you remember that time in your life? Like many of you watching right now, I'm also a graduate of Rutgers University. I graduated in 2016, and that was the year President Obama spoke at the graduation ceremony. And, you know, Obama, despite the fact that you're this very important person that you spoke to me on my last day as a Rutgers student. I'm sorry to tell you, it wasn't you that kicked off my career, but it was actually Dr. Ashley Koenig. She, see, at, uh, as a Rutgers student, I worked at the Eagleton Center for Public Interest Polling uh, starting in 2014. I started as a phone interviewer. In other words, I was one of those crazy kids who would call you every once in a while, begging you to take a survey about New Jersey politics. Uh, in reality, it's important work, and I learned about the rigorous methodology of collecting data, turning it into a bigger picture that would then inform the decisions of our politicians, which would ultimately affect you and how you live. Now, I'm not trying to convince you to take a survey right now, but I want you to know that Eagleton provided me with these experiences, which at the time I didn't realize were priceless. To me, working as an interviewer at the Eagleton was just another job, an easy way to make money. But that changed when Dr. Ashley Conan came along. For the majority of my time at Eagleton, Ashley served as the associate director of the poll. And for some weird reason, she always took a liking to me, trusted me with tasks that I had never done before. So in 2016, she started spending more time with the students. I could tell something was up and I was right because later that year, David Redlosk, the director director of the poll announced that he was leaving. Ashley would end up becoming the new director and she would put her complete trust in me to oversee the entire 100 plus student workers at the poll by promoting me to manager. So even though I was working in this role, I was still unconvinced that I would enter this line of work, going to uh, school for a physician's assistant or working edu in a, a, the education industry were higher on my list. And Ashley Coding though, she did a very good job of convincing me because uh, when I say she kicked off my career, I meant it. She actually referred me and recommended me for a job, looked over my resume, and when they offered me the position, she even, locked, uh, she even looked at the contract to make sure I, was, I wasn't getting played, to make sure I was getting what I deserve. And today, I'm still at that position. The name of the company is called Edison Research. 
and it's based right here in New Jersey. And it, it's best known as the company that conducts the exit polls on election nights for the major news networks like CBS, NBC, CNN. Now, if you've heard of statistics like 54% of women voted for Hillary Clinton and another 41% voted for Donald Trump in 2016, then you've probably seen our data before. So thanks to Ashley, I can say that I will have played a role in one of the most historical US elections next week. But although election research is part of this job, my strong suit is actually in Edison's media, uh, media and entertainment research. When Dr. Ashley Cronin got me at the job in 2017, I started off in the lowest of the ranks, something called a project coordinator working primarily on music tests. For those of you who didn't know, the radio stations in cities across the world hire nerds like myself to conduct research on their fans so they can, so they can decide whether to play Drake or Kiss. Um, but anyway, I will go on to capture the trust of this company. And much of this is just the result of accepting responsibilities I had zero experience in, but I knew I was capable of. And I thank Ashley for that, for giving me the autonomy at Eagleton to explore the areas outside of my comfort zone and to learn how to function in those areas. As an instructor at the poli sci department and as a director of the poll, I'm sure she still continues to do this for other students. See, Edison Research trusts me so much that I was even able to author and present my own research. The Latino Podcast Listener Report, which has left the mark on the podcast industry and will serve as a tool for better representation of Latinos in podcasts. And I like to think I was influenced by the surrounding political research that Ashley conducted on gender and race at the Eagleton. Um, when the president of Edison Research, uh, Edison Research asked me to do a 40 minute presentation in front of 500 or so Univision, iHeartRadio and other radio station executives and radio personalities at a national conference, I knew I had to accept nervous Hell yes, I was completely nervous, but it's great to have a mentor like Ashley because I knew she had co-authored research papers. I had seen her on the news. Uh, and because of that, I knew that I could do it too. The pr presentation ended up being a success and it's one of my career highlights. And to this day, I still remember the conversations with Ashley at the pool, you know, in the carriage house behind the Eagleton mansion, limited space, tight corridors. She would tell me, Gabe, you should look into survey research. I think you're cut out for it. And I guess she was right because in a matter of three years at the job she sent my way, I have been promoted not once, but twice from coordinator to manager of research and now director of research. Uh, I never thought that I would be working directly with companies like Apple, Spotify, NPR and conducting some of their most important research. But you know who did? Ashley did. Uh, working at Edison helped me realize that I had a passion for this line of work. So thank you, Ashley, for always looking uh, at my potential. Now, one thing my boss at Edison always said to me when I was still a coordinator, she would always say, Edison is lucky to have you, right? Early on, I always thought it was something she said to everyone. I always thought it was something nice to say to people, but now I take it seriously. However, I think the more honest statement is that Edison is lucky not to have me, but they're lucky to have you, the alumni and donors who reach into their pocket to support the endeavors of students and people like me, the staff for fostering and encouraging a learning environment, and of course, the person who is about to take over your screen. Thank you to all of you, and thank you, Ashley. I know it wasn't supposed to take this long, but you know, it's not every day that you get to thank your mentor in front of people like you. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a virtual round of applause and welcoming my mentor. She's going to be talking about the art and the science of polling, as well as the 2020 presidential election. The, the, the director of the Eagleton Center for Public Interest Polling herself, Dr. Ashley Koning. Hi, everyone. Um, I did not think that I would be starting this presentation off teary eyed and uh, super choked up. Um, I haven't seen Gabe. Uh, we, we had a, a rehearsal the other week, but I, Gabe and I haven't seen each other for probably 
more than over a year, if, if not longer. Um, and I am so darn proud of him. Uh, and my baby's all grown up. Um, and, and that's, I think, part of the, the real beauty of um, Rutgers and, and what we do at Rutgers in so many aspects. Uh, Gabe, thank you so, so much. That was absolutely beautiful. Everybody, I hope you're staying safe and well um, in all of these unprecedented times. And hopefully we can have a fun next hour and talk a little bit about uh, polling. Um, so let's get right to it. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the art, the science, and of course, what everybody is waiting for six days away, a look at the 2020 presidential election and, and to go along with the theme of how incredible Rutgers is in so many countless areas um, where Rutgers soars unbelievably. Um, one of the, of course, near and dear to my heart is the Eagleton Institute of Politics over on Douglas campus, which has been around since 1956. Um, for me, as uh, someone who is a Jersey girl who came back home to do her PhD in Hickman Hall, uh, in political science and uh, found out right across the street, there was an institute that celebrated the practical side of politics and the, the uh, participation of people in the political process and giving voice to the voiceless. Um, I, I feel so incredibly lucky and honored to be a part of the Eagleton Institute, which houses um, a number of fantastic centers. Uh, first and foremost, uh, one of the oldest with ourselves uh, were the two oldest centers, the Center for American Women in Politics and the Eagleton Center for Public Interest Polling, my own center. We've been around since 1971, the first two centers of the Eagleton Institute. And to newer centers like uh, the Miller Center, the Center on the American Governor and the Center for Youth Political Participation. I encourage everyone to check out each one of these centers in the Eagleton website uh, for information leading up to election day, every single center and Eagleton as a whole has been doing an incredible job uh, it, on various aspects of the election, of course, our aspect being polling, um, but really just an absolute wealth of information, cops studying uh, women leaders and, and women voters, the Center for Youth Political Participation uh, doing uh, national campaigns right now in terms of getting out the vote and, and uh, voter registration drives, just an immense amount of work um, that is going on over on Douglas campus. And so as Rutgers alums, you should be so incredibly proud about um, everything that, that Eagleton has been doing. So as I mentioned, we are, uh, we are center since 1971 under the Eagleton, in Eagleton Institute flag. We've been around for 50 years. Uh, next year will be our 50th anniversary. And actually, once again, Rutgers has a very special legacy in the polling world. The Eagleton Center for Public Interest Polling is actually the oldest statewide university-based survey research center home of the Rutgers Eagleton poll in the country. The Rutgers Eagleton poll actually uh, birthed a bunch of other polls around the country and, and began a phenomena of um, state level, statewide polling uh, across the country in various states and, and that were academically based. Um, you know, we, we always seem to be sandwiched between these two media markets of Philadelphia and New York. And so the Rutgers Eagleton poll was uh, started with the intent of actually, um, you know, filling that gap of assessing public opinion among New Jersey residents and, and uh, having a, a place of prominence within New Jersey media and, and providing some voice to uh, New Jerseyans. So like I said, we've been around now for almost 50 years. We have over 200 public opinion polls. We do about one to two public opinion polls statewide every semester. We will actually be coming out with results very, very soon on the election, on voting by mail and on the pandemic. We also do a whole host of research project, projects for entities and researchers, both within and outside of Rutgers, within and outside of New Jersey, as well as nationally, um, as well as working uh, with the state government. So, you know, we, we kind of run the gamut in terms of topics that we cover and, and ways in which we do surveys. Um, so this is our website. I would really uh, encourage you to check it out. We actually have all of our press releases up on our website since 1971. So you can have some fun and search for those really important topics like deer hunting and, and tattoos and going down the shore. And of course, my personal favorite pork roll versus Taylor ham. Uh, hint, hint, it's a tie. Um, and, and there's a big regional divide. And you know, maybe those lesser topics like elections and, and taxes and the economy. Of course, let's flip those around. But you know, we have uh, uh, all of our press releases and all of our data um, dating back to 1971 up on our website if you ever wanted to uh, take a search and, and look through all of that. 
So let's talk a little bit about polling in general. This is one of those things that everybody is uh, deluged with polling. Um, so, you know, I, I ask this a lot when I give this kind of talk to various classes in terms of, you know, what is the first thing that comes to somebody's mind? Have they been polled before? Do they pay attention to polls? You know, what, what comes to mind when they think of polls? And I think polls have been getting a really bad rap in recent, uh, you know, years and especially election cycles. I like to be a hopeless romantic, both in my um, profession and in my, my personal life. I like to believe in the, the small d democratic purpose of polling. Um, and this, this goes all the way back to George Gallup, kind of known as the godfather of scientific modern day public opinion polling, that polls are crucial for the small d democratic process. They connect the people with the policymakers and help to improve government. And so, you know, there, there are a variety of participatory acts that we can, uh, you know, take part in as the citizenry of the country, but a lot of these acts require time and money and other resources. Writing a letter to a member of Congress, attending a, a rally or a protest, um, donating financially to a candidate. All of these take resources that some people may not have. And the beauty of polls is that they're, they're supposed to represent people in a population in proportion to how those individuals are within a population. So, you know, we, the onus is on us to contact you and to ask you for a few minutes of your time, sometimes even monetarily incentivizing you for that time in order to assess public opinion and get an accurate read of what public opinion is, not just who attended uh, a particular meeting, not just who has the, the uh, financial uh, stability to, to provide a donation, uh, but really representing the voices of everybody in proportion to how they are in the population. And I like to believe that that is the purpose of polling. And that's why polling is so important. And, and a lot of the, the controversy always bubbles up around election cycles uh, because of this, this focus and probably too much of a focus on the horse race. And I think it's really important to recognize how much public opinion polling does, especially for those issues that never get their day on the ballot or never get an election day and how uh, you know, issues um, as recent as things like same-sex marriage have become, the polling on them have become consequential to policy change. So we're gonna go through a little bit of a, a path here. We'll do a little crash course. Uh, you guys can be my class for the evening. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the uh, future of polling and the challenges it's facing. And then I'm sure as everybody would like to discuss the 2020 presidential election. So time for a crash course. One of the biggest questions I always get is, but nobody ever called me. Um, how do we know that polls are accurate if nobody ever called me? And so let's start out by talking about who we talk to, how we determine this, um, how we determine who and how we talk to people. And so first and foremost, we have to think about who do we actually wanna to talk to? What population under study do we want to observe? And of course, it's an election time and during election times, we most likely will want to talk to voters. A lot of polling, especially polling not, door, not done during elections, are talking to an entire population, whether it's all residents of the state of New Jersey like we do, all residents of the country, all residents of, of somewhere outside of the US. Uh, but when it's election time, more often than not, you want to talk to the people that actually vote. And as we get closer to an election, you don't wanna just talk to the people who are registered to vote and we know that are able to vote. You wanna to talk to the people most likely to turn out to vote. And so, you know, we're, we're getting to a smaller and smaller portion of the population, especially during election cycles in terms of who we want to talk to. Um, and it gets, it gets difficult to do that. And we'll talk about some of the reasons later on. But, you know, and, and pollsters try to get at uh, who they wanna to talk to through a variety of different means. Most often, if we're talking about telephone surveys, we're doing something called random digit dialing, which is essentially cold calling. We know while there is a very large, there's also a very finite number of phone numbers that if we randomized digits in phone numbers and we knew the area codes that we wanted to contact, we could randomize a list of phone numbers to call and we wouldn't know who we were calling. It would be a, a random sample of phone numbers within the geographic area that we were polling. And so this is called random digit dialing. As we enter pre-election cycles, um, a lot of times pollsters will actually use voter databases and voter files and do what's called registration-based sampling and sampling from a list of voters. They know these people have already signed up to be voters. 
or they've already, they're already on this list because they're a voter and therefore they're contacting them about the election. So first things first, it's important to, as a pollster, know who you want to contact. As a poll consumer, it's important to know who that pollster is contacting. We know that races tighten between, if we're looking at just all citizens and registered voters, races tighten even further still if we're talking about a comparison between registered and likely voters, because obviously likely voters are the ones who will be most likely to turn out. So do we actually pull everybody in a population under study? No, we don't. And we really can't. It would take me a ton of money and Rutgers would probably be really unhappy uh, and a ton of time to talk to every single New Jerseyan in the state. It's just not feasible. It's not plausible. So what pollsters do is they take a sample of the population of interest. They take a, a portion of that population and they talk to that population and study that population, uh, conduct a survey with that, with that sample and generalize those results back typically to the population as a whole. And again, you're gonna hear me say this a few times, it's those issues of time and money for pollsters in terms of why they just can't talk to everybody. That's why you see every 10 years, the lift of doing the US Census is so uh, large and is, is such a lift because of this, because it takes an unbelievable amount of time and money to actually count every single person within a population. Now, I don't know about you guys, if, if you grew up on the Muppets or you have kids or grandkids who grew up on the Muppets, but um, you know, I like to always show the Swedish chef over here because I think it's a great reminder of what sampling is. So, uh, you know, um, if, if you uh, are cooking something, I'm a big cook, um, you know, if, if you're cooking something uh, and you're doing a, a pot of sauce or a pot of stew or something and you take a little taste, you're sampling your sauce or stew. And you know in that little taste, you know all the flavors from your soup or your sauce, not just some of them. It's a representative bite of whatever you're cooking. Same thing when you go to the doctor. You uh, get blood drawn at the doctor. The doctor doesn't take all your blood. He or she will take a, a vial of blood and that vial of blood is representative of all the blood in your system. So that's how sampling works. When people are skeptical of sampling, I always try to refer to these different kind of analogies because you know, we do sampling all the time in life, we just don't realize it. And that's why it also works uh, in polling, especially when it's done in a scientific manner. And the scientific version of sampling is something we call probability sampling, probability-based sampling, random sampling. This is where each member of the population has an equal unknown chance of being part of a sample for any survey or poll. So for example, if you don't get called or someone you know doesn't get called, it's highly likely that somebody in that survey or poll uh, represents your opinions in some fashion. Um, and so this is kind of the gold standard of polling. It's considered one of the best practices to have a probability-based sample. A lot of times this is synonymous with telephone polls and we can go into a little bit about survey modes in a moment. Um, but this is, this is why telephone polls are held to this gold standard within the, the polling industry because, because we can randomly generate phone numbers it is, it is more uh, feasible, plausible to get a probability-based sample, a random sample that we can generalize back to the population. And that's kind of the goal of assessing public opinion. Non-probability samples have often been synonymous with online surveys, although that's changing a little bit. But if you think about it, we really can't uh, randomly sample email addresses, right? We don't have Rutgers alum one at Rutgers.edu, Rutgers alum two at Rutgers.edu, Anyone can pick whatever they want for uh, their email address. And there are so many different email servers. So non-probability samples are usually those samples for convenience. It's when you go on Facebook or you go on a website or a news site and it says, click here to take this survey or this poll. We don't know what the chances are of any one unit being picked. And so that's why we see online and non-probability smushed together a lot of the times. But we can talk about uh, some of the strides in online polling, it's become more and more popular. But non-probability type sampling is, is not the recommended way, uh, while, while more cost and certainly more time efficient at times, it is not kind of up to the gold standard of polling. And so always an important thing to look out for when you're looking at any kind of poll, but particularly in pre-elections, was this done at random? Was this a probability-based sample or was this a non-probability-based sample? And because we're sampling the population, we pay a price for sampling instead of talking to everyone. 
And this price that we pay is something called the margin of error. You guys have probably heard of this uh, a lot because hopefully the media is emphasizing this more um, than they did back in 2016. And so we know that a result probably won't exactly match the true result that we would get if we talked to every single person in the population. So the margin of error describes how close we can reasonably expect that survey result to fall relative to the true population value if we actually did that. Usually this is assessed at something called a 95% confidence level, meaning that if we did this uh, survey 100 times, we would expect our result to be within that margin of error of the true population 95 out of those 100 times. So this is the, the price we pay and margin of error is determined by things like the size of the sample, the variability of what exactly is being measured or asked about on the survey, how we weight the data, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on, how we design our sample and our questionnaire, and the proportion of the sample, proportion of the population that we are sampling. And so this goes back to uh, talking about the law of large numbers, right? The larger the sample we have, the closer it's going to get to the population number, which means the better the estimate it's going to be of the population. And so the larger the sample, the closer the population, the smaller the margin of error because obviously we're approaching the actual population size. But there's a caveat to this. A lot of times you're going to see uh, pollsters hit this sweet spot in polling of maybe anywhere from 800 to 1,000 to 1,200 respondents in a poll. And this is because, again, those issues of time and money. Um, we, we, you know, at a point, it stops being beneficial to spend money and time on collecting more respondents when the margin of error is only decreasing by a little bit. We can see that the first several hundred respondents really quickly impact in a positive way the margin of error, getting that margin of error down and down and down. But after about a thousand, we kind of see this plateau in the bottom graph. And let me just enlarge this so you guys can see it a little better. So we can see that if we had a sample size of hundred people, our margin of error is plus or minus 10 percentage points. That means that if somebody if our estimate in the survey is 50%, that means really, if we talk to everybody in the true population, the result could be anywhere from 40% to 60%. That's a pretty wide range. So that's why pollsters try to do several hundred respondents uh, within a survey, if not a thousand or breaking over a thousand, because then that margin of error shrinks to plus or minus three. So if we had that 50% estimate, that means well, it's either 47% or anywhere to 53%, creating a much smaller confidence band around our estimate. This was one of the biggest problems back in 2016 with the GOP primaries. You had the primary debates being based off of polling and pollsters strongly advocated against this because you would have somebody like former Governor Chris Christie at say 3% and Senator Ted Cruz at 4%. But if you factored in the margin of error on a, a sample size of 200 likely voters, likely Republican voters, that's a pretty large margin of error. That's probably a double digit margin of error um, or at least in the high single digits. And so really the, the governor could have been above uh, Ted Cruz, Ted Cruz could have been below. It, it just was not a, a stable uh, way to determine the debates. And it's such a good example though of how margin of error comes into play and how it's misunderstood and how sample size uh, really is inversely related to the margin of error. And so the more sample we have, the more confident in our results, the closer to the population we are. Uh, if we actually talk to everyone in the population, the smaller our margin of error. So for example, the New York Times Siena College poll had a poll of likely voters in Pennsylvania recently, 49% uh, Biden, 40% Trump with a margin of error of plus or minus 4.3 percentage points. What's really important to take away from this is the, the media will talk about the margin of error and you know we, we think we have this understanding of what the margin of error is, but the way in which we understand the margin of error is actually applied to single estimates, not to candidate head to head. So if you take away anything, definitely keep in mind that the margin of error when we're talking about pre-election polls and we're talking about head to heads and matchups between candidates, Keep in mind, as the right side of this table shows, you actually have to double the margin of error when you're talking about the margin between two candidates. So if we apply that example to the Siena uh, New York Times College poll, if we apply that example, there's a nine point difference between the two candidates. If we doubled that 4.3 percentage point margin of error, 
that means that, you know, really this race could be plus 8.6 on top of the nine points, or it could really almost be uh, under a single digit difference. And so what we need to look for is that doubling of the margin of error when we're talking about pre-election polls. And if that margin uh, does not include zero, we know that it's a statistically reliable lead. This was one of the big problems in 2016, which we'll get to a little bit later, that uh, razor thin margins were being interpreted as vis victories or statistical dead heats or ties. And we were talking about the race as 49, 48, 47, 45. Um, and really the, the margin of error was not being factored in. And so we, we have to make sure we're understanding what the margin error of error is and how to apply it to head to heads to know where the race really is. The other thing is questionnaire design. So we're kind of going through the process of what a pollster does uh, to produce a poll all the way through presenting the results. And if you have started to notice a thing, there, there is a lot of decision making that needs to be done by any polling entity throughout the polling process. This is another one of those points of decision making, probably some of the most subjective because the pollster is the one who is determining what questions to ask and how to ask them. And as we like to say, you don't know anything about the results unless you know how the questions were worded, how they were ordered and how they were formatted on a questionnaire. That's why it's always important for any pollster to show uh, what the question wording was and the order in which the questions came. This has a huge impact on responses that respondents give, uh, whether we're talking about the order in which questions were presented, whether something was brought to their mind to influence them. There's a really famous study that political scientists did framing a KKK rally as a security threat versus freedom of speech. And of course, support was slightly greater in the version that respondents received when it was framed as freedom of speech than framed as a security threat. So, you know, we, we are humans and human behavior gets very easily influenced by a, a myriad of different things. So we wanna make sure that our questionnaires follow best practices, but also there's really no secret formula to how to design them. There, there are standards by which any credible pollster will follow. And a lot of those I address here uh, in the bubbles. But again, you know, a, a lot of this is left up to interpretation and what that polling entity thinks is best to do. But of course, you always want to make sure that you have mutually exclusive and exhaustive response options to give respondents, that they're clear and respondents understand what's being asked and understand the response options being given. And even depending on how you word the response options, whether you're forcing them into a yes, no, whether you're giving a scale of very, somewhat, not very, or not at all, or whether you're completely giving an open-ended question and asking the person to tell you verbatim how they feel, that's all going to influence the data and the results. So it's very important to pay attention to how the questions were asked and the order in which the questions were asked because that has a huge impact on the resulting data. For data collection, we talked a little bit about this already, but mode makes a, a big impact on the results as well. Uh, any pollster will need to decide how they're doing this survey. Like I said, telephones have long been treated as the gold standard in survey research and they still are to a large extent. It just, the problem is they're, they're incredibly expensive. Um, but you'll see lots of telephone surveys. Um, you know, we ourselves for our public opinion statewide poll, we do a telephone survey. Uh, but then for uh, various projects, we fit the design to the, the study at hand. And so sometimes um, there will be paper surveys that are mailed out. Sometimes there will be web surveys to which we are, are texting a link to or emailing a link to. And so surveys are done in a variety of different ways and sometimes done in multiple ways for one survey. Uh, so it's always important to see what mode that they're done in. There, there have been shown there are some differences in by so survey mode, uh, both in the 2016 election cycle and in this election cycle. So it's also really important to pay attention and know how surveys were conducted in terms of the mode, um, because that also gives some indication on, on you know, how you can interpret the data. Um, obviously, when you're on the phone with somebody, there are a whole host of, of advantages and disadvantages as opposed to filling it out online, um, you know, there, there are pros and cons in every one of these modes and it's important to recognize them. Now, hopefully for any of my Broadway fans out there, you recognize my, my headlines Hamilton joke uh, that's in the, in the header. Um, but this is the next important step. Once we decide who we're talking to, once we um, take the sample of the population that we want to talk to, design the questionnaire, conduct the survey, 
of that questionnaire and the mode or modes that we decide to do it in, we need to weight the data. And weighting simply is a statistical tool we use to balance out our samples so it matches the population even better. Samples are almost never a known match for the population at hand because some people are more likely to answer than others. Typically women, older residents, uh, those who are politically interested and those who are civically engaged. And so what we do is we balance out our sample to resemble population parameters that we find out from the US Census, which is why the US Census is so incredibly important to pollsters uh, every, every 10 years. Um, so what we do is called waiting. And this will be consequential when we're discussing 2016, but typically in the past, pollsters have waited to demographics like gender, age, race, ethnicity, and region. They typically will never uh, wait to attitudes or, or behaviors, but rather more to stationary demographics or, or demographics that have logical change like age as you get older to make sure that these key demographics are represented within your sample, whether we're talking about a statewide poll or a national poll. And we can see that different weights and different sample frames produce different results. So uh, this is just a snippet from 2016 of how if we're talking about registered voters ver versus likely voters versus uh, voters that are unweighted versus voters that are weighted, you can see that number jiggles from 65 to 62 to 65 again to 69 because weighting will slightly change the numbers a bit. Weighting is making up for any of those previous decisions that a pollster makes, waiting is trying to balance out the sample to the best of its ability um, before we finalize data and release results. And so sometimes very often those numbers will change to make sure we have a representative uh, sample of the population and therefore our resulting data will wiggle a little bit uh, based on what weights we're applying. I think nothing captures it better than this experiment from 2016 that the New York Times Upshot and Siena College did with four other pollsters. They actually gave their data set of a 2016 poll to four other pollsters and said, you determine who you want to talk to, you determine how you want to weight this data, you tell us what the head-to-head -head is resulting after you do all of your pollster magic to the poll. And so as you can see, in almost every single instance, we have a different head-to-head we have a variety of different margins. And while four out of the five pollsters uh, took that data and found a win for Clinton, one of the pollsters actually found a win for Trump. And this is such a, a uh, stark example of the difference that different weighting schemes can make, as well as whether or not we're using registered voters or likely voters um, in our polling. And so, you know, I, I think it's an amazing example because there's no secret sauce or, or special sauce or secret formula for weighting. Much like a lot of these other decisions, while there are best practices and gold standards when it comes to weighting, the, the formula that a pollster or a polling entity or a statistician concocts is kind of something of their own almost. And so again, while a lot of these practices are common among pollsters, everybody has their own little touch. And that's why we get things like seeing different results. That's why polls taken at the same time asking very similar questions can show different results uh, when we're looking at multiple polls about the same subject. All of these indicators, who we're talking to, how we're asking the questions, how we're collecting the data, how we're weighting the data, all of these different parts of the survey research process affect the final results that we see. Therefore, because of this, I would strongly stress to never ever look at a single poll Polls are a snapshot in time. Hopefully you've heard that over and over and over again this election cycle, but polls are simply that. They're a snapshot in time. They're assessment of public opinion in the very moment that, uh, that the interviewer or the pollster is speaking to somebody providing the answers. Um, that's why it's always better to look at trends and looking at multiple polls to show overarching storylines of what's happening. And I would strongly advocate you know, to put these polls in context of their averages and look at places like Real Clear Politics, 538, and the New York Times Upshot, polling aggregators and forecasters to do so. And so let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the difficulties and the challenges that we face as an industry. One of the biggest challenges is cell phones. Um, as you can see, this is from 2018, over half of adults uh, have, are in a wireless only household. That number has increased as of December, 2019 to 61%. 
uh, children uh, even more likely to be in wireless only households. We can see there's also an impact by age. Cell phones have had a really humongous effect on the survey research industry between uh, having to call them, um, people not as likely to pick up phones anymore in general, people going more to texting, caller ID, uh, spam and uh, robo -call calls that come on to um, cell phones and landlines alike. This has all really reshaped the, the survey research industry within the past 10 years, even up to probably about 10 years ago, pollsters will, were still con conducting landline uh, only telephone polls and having a pretty good representation of the population. And now that's pretty much gone out the window with the, the polling gods like Pew Research Center polling up to about 75% cell phones and only 25% landline because of this, this split that we see in terms of how many in the population are wireless only. Another large por portion are wireless mostly and very few anymore are landline only or landline mostly within their households. So cell phones have become a really important measure. Cell phones also make it much more expensive um, to dial uh, because of, of federal rules and regulations. It's actually uh, making it even more costly to do polling with polls costing tens of thousands of dollars, um, sometimes depending on the population, 100,000 or more, um, depending on, on you know, the, the specifics of that poll. Response rates uh, likewise have declined. And this is, this is somewhat related to cell phones, related to the usage and, and uh, how we treat phones in general nowadays. And so response rates have been on the decline for the past several decades, now in the single digits. And in fact, as you can see from the graph, down to about 6% after 2016, likely because of respondent fatigue following the 2016 in, in uh, election and uh, a lack of a trust in polls. So while we had plateaued at about a 9% response rate for a while, across the industry, we're at an average about a 6% response rate. The, the weak answer to all of this is that we can still say with some confidence uh, as seen through academic studies by Pew Research Center and others that we do not, uh, we are not just because we have a low response rate, this doesn't correlate necessarily to um, an unrepresentativeness of our samples. We still see uh, a, a lack of uh, bias between who we're talking to and who we're not talking to, but there's always a deep seated fear within the industry that at, at some point, is that going to change? Is our low response rates going to indicate uh, less representativeness? And like I said, as of right now, that's not the case, but of course it's always a concern. The, the odd pandemic silver lining of all this is pollsters across the industry have seen an increase in response rates since the pandemic um, and uh, people willing to talk, people being home. So far, um, almost some in the double digits in terms of response rate. Determining likely voters, this is another huge decision, another very subjective decision uh, that every pollster goes to goes through who is doing pre-election polling. Um, you know, we see numbers in the media that's presented as a very right and wrong, concrete, these are the numbers and that's it. But these numbers have a range. They are, they are simply estimates and they need to be understood and embraced as estimates. And we know who, who lives in the country we know who's registered to vote by voter files, but we don't know who's likely to turn out. And we don't know if it's going to be the same as the previous election, two elections ago, three elections ago. It is notoriously difficult to determine who likely voters actually are. And again, this is another formula that is concocted and subjective based on what the pollster feels based on, on theory and based on precedent, how the pollster, uh, you know, their best educated guess in terms of who will be likely to turn out on election day, made even more complicated this cycle because of things like the, the pandemic and a change in the uh, mailing system. There are polls like Monmouth University who, be, who does a lot of battleground states that have actually been showing a range of turnouts now so that um, they are, are trying to publicize the, the following, that we should be embracing uncertainty, that we shouldn't be focusing on one single set of numbers but that we should be focusing on the range and the probability of different occurrences because these are not, polls are not meant to be crystal balls or predictive tools. They're meant to tell us the why and the, they're meant to be explanatory. Uh, and they're, they're all based on probability and on estimates and it needs to be recognized more so. So I always like to give the example of, you know, if you see a 20% chance of rain in the forecast, you're probably going to bring your umbrella still. And so polls, on the other hand, however, are treated as, as these binary entities, this right and wrong, um, when really that they're, they, they are an estimate within a band of confidence. 
um, and, and our tools of probability, which needs to be, you know, more forthright and recognized. All right, so let's get a little bit into uh, 2020 and uh, we have less than a week to go. I love this tweet. I think this sums up 2020 to a T. Uh, the poll was conducted immediately after the fiasco, but prior to the brouhaha, questions with an asterisk were added in the final days of feeling following the hullabaloo, the results are an essentially stable race. Um, this election, these past several months are uh, of course, absolutely unprecedented. I think that's the, the word of the time unprecedented. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, we have not seen much movement in this race. But before we jump into the race, let's rewind quickly to 2016. Um, and uh, I know we're, we're kind of running a little short on time. So I may go through quickly uh, some of these slides a little bit. But if you remember back to 2016, we, we had a lot of variables that came up. Um, on election day that were not accounted for by the polls. And it was perceived that there was a very large polling mishap. And there were a couple reasons for this. And I, I think the perception is a wrong one, honestly, at least when it comes to the national polls. We saw a move among uh, undecided voters, late decided voters and third party voters shifted to Trump. We saw higher turnout in Trump states uh, and competitive states that Trump won. And we did not see early voting as a predictor for the election day outcomes. We can also see from the right side of the slide that Clinton took a, a huge hit in voter turnout compared to Obama in 2012 than Trump did compared to Romney in 2012. And so there were things that polls as blunt instruments simply couldn't measure that really made an impact on election day um, in terms of, of being a, an upset, at least according to the polls. What was really um, kind of the crux of the issue here were state level polls. And while national polling is what we're used to seeing and, and you know, where the bulk of the polls are done, uh, national polls really reflect the popular vote. And we know as American citizens um, or as voters and, or as part of the country, we know that the popular vote is not what determines our elections. It's the electoral college and the best representation of the electoral college is the state level polling. And so there was actually historic errors in state level polling um, you know, New Jersey doesn't matter anymore, so this doesn't apply to us, but in those battleground states across the country, there were historic errors uh, that we've seen that we haven't seen in, in decades. And so there was about a four percentage point error in state level polls. And there was a lot of questioning in terms of whether these state level polls were not done well enough, uh, not close enough to election day, or there, there were simply not enough of them, not enough frequency, not enough quantity state level polling is exceptionally hard to do. It takes a lot of time and money. And so for a lot of statewide uh, polling centers, it's a very big lift and they may not be able to either follow best practices simply because of financial constraints, or they may only be able to put out one or two polls approaching election day. And so we really had a deficit of statewide polling, which of course is what mirrors our electoral college. Um, and this especially came into play with a lot of the states that were, were battlegrounds, uh, where Trump is expected to lose in the Midwest, and particularly with states that had more whites without a college degree. And we'll talk about education in a second. Um, the good news is polls have been fairly accurate, including in 2016, but also since then, increasingly so. 2016, while we had a lot of surrounding blips in polling like Brexit, like the 2016 election, other international incidences, uh, you know, um, incidents, polls have been fairly accurate across decades and across various countries. And we saw that even more so in 2018. And in fact, 2016 was just as accurate as other presidential elections since 1972. So getting back to that issue of education, this is something that was, was kind of one of the, um, the, the biggest lessons from 2016 that pollsters have learned very well and are actively trying to correct. Um, pollsters were not necessarily waiting to education back in 2016, which uh, was consequential um, in 2016 polling. We saw for the first time ever a very large split, not just in the non-college educated versus college educated vote, but particularly among white voters between those college educated and those non-college educated. And so pollsters are now actively waiting to education in their polling to make sure that they're accounting for this. Um, and so when we had talked about waiting in one of the previous slides and waiting to gender, age, race, ethnicity, and so on, this is one of those demographics now that are being waited to because 
people, people who take polls are usually more highly educated. It makes them more interested to answer a poll. And if this is an underlying factor that's determining vote choice, where ha whereas it hadn't before, this is something now being thrown into models to, and, and weighting formulas uh, to make sure that those who are non-college educated are being accounted for since they seem to have differing opinions. So we have six days to go. Let's take a quick peek into some of the, the forecasting models that are out there on the internet. This was back in mid-September. Uh, Biden had a um, three and four chance roughly. Fast forwarding to today, we're now at 89 and 100 for Biden, 11 and 100 for Trump. Uh, so out of 40,000 simulations that 538 uh, ran affiliated with ABC, um, out of 40,000 simulations, this is where they think the election is headed with six days to go. And we can see that uh, we almost have about a 10 point difference between the two candidates according to 538's model. Um, these are the electoral college votes predicted with Biden predicted to get 345, Trump 193. The Economist, very similar uh, forecast. In terms of their, their electoral votes and what the popular vote will look like. What has been um, astounding to watch as a pollster is the unprecedented, there's that word again, unprecedented, the unprecedented enduring lead that Biden has had. In fact, I think since 2017 and any head to head with Trump, he has led the, the national polling average almost every single time um, since 2017. And I think Real Clear Politics, which is another great source, depicts this really nicely with the graph. Over time, we've seen this, this uh, margin between the candidates um, move, but we've especially seen some really good boosts for Biden around the pandemic, the protests, and then the first presidential debate and when President Trump had tested positive for coronavirus. So this is, like I said, this is an unprecedented lead. It's, it's been a sustainable lead, it's been sizable, and there have been events uh, since, uh, you know, since the, the thick of the campaign, like the convention, the presidential debate, um, the town hall, the second presidential debate, None of this has really moved the race. Uh, we should have seen a tightening in the race at this point, and we still really have not. Um, there are a whole, there's a whole list of these kind of firsts that uh, Biden's lead um, has, has embodied this election cycle. Most importantly, he has pulled above 50%, the 50% mark a number of times, whereas Clinton back in 2016 has never reached that. Um, and according to 538, Nate Silver at 538, uh, depending on the size of this lead up through election day, um, that will be a, a pretty good determinant of where we will see the electoral college fall as well, depending on how big that lead is. And again, this is the largest lead of any presidential candidate in decades. You can see how Biden versus Trump at the very end uh, is, is a, a larger lead than we've seen um, in many decades for many of these election cycles. And the roots of this lead are coming from a lot of different sources. Uh, white suburban voters, white women in particular, who started moving in 2018 towards Democrats are, are moving from Trump to Biden. Battleground states, Biden on average has had the lead in them, especially consequential states uh, like Pennsylvania and Michigan and Wisconsin. Pennsylvania kind of being the, the key pivotal state here for the election. And he's also gaining with that important demographic of non-college educated, especially non-college educated white voters as we had talked about before. That being said, what's interesting is there's kind of been this reversal in uh, who uh, these candidates have been courting. And President Trump has actually been making inroads with both Hispanic voters to varying degrees, particularly male Hispanic voters, and with Black voters as well. Um, so the, the race is still in flux. And while we see that there has not been much movement, again, polls are blunt instruments where there are a variety of things that could happen within the next almost week, and the race should never be at this point considered over. Um, you know, we're dealing with voter turnout. Uh, you know, um, we're dealing with a completely new voting system in most cases for states, a pandemic. We generally should see a tightening of the race. Who knows if that tightening of the race will happen uh, from tomorrow onward. We know that there is an enthusiasm gap. Those who are voting for Biden are voting uh, really in opposition to Trump instead of for Biden. We know that Trump supporters are much more likely to support Trump and are voting because of that. Um, statewide polling, again, are we polling enough? Are we, are we doing them close enough to election day, particularly in battlegrounds? Do we have any October surprises left? 
uh, you know, or is, does the shy Trumper theory that's been circulating around, does that have any credence? Um, so, you know, even when we're applying the 2016 errors to the current 2020 election, uh, we still see that this could be a win for Biden. But I would say, remember to embrace that uncertainty. Remember to never say never. Remember to think probabilistically. And remember that there are a whole host of factors and these snapshots in time that polls assess. Always look for the usual suspects when you're looking at polls. Um, always you know, be careful of media interpretation, the over-reliance on one poll in particular. Make sure that you're paying attention to, attention to statewide polls and how polls are being done. Um, with that, I'm gonna wrap it up. Uh, so this was, as I said, or, or no, I haven't mentioned yet, this was my pandemic project. Um, I, I, uh, we, we had our first little son uh, in June. And so he has been the love of my life and, and the most important thing in my life. Um, so hopefully he'll be crunching data for us at the Eagleton Center for Public Interest Polling in no time. Uh, but with that, I'm more than happy to take a couple questions. I can actually stay till 6.05. Um, and please feel free to email me if we're not able to get to your question. Thank you so, so much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ashley. Uh, we'll get right into the questions um, so we can get to as many as possible. Um, one good question that I saw is what changes have been made to exit polling processes to account for the shift um, to vote by mail and early voting? That's a great question. Uh, and I may let Gabe uh, give an answer because he works for the exit polling company. But to my knowledge, uh, there's been a lot more of pre-counting of the vote by telephone poll um, with talking about those who have already voted, those who voted by mail, voted early. And in person at polling places, I believe there will be uh, paper surveys and pencils and interviewers will socially distance and point um, voters to those tables to fill out surveys with uh, disposable uh, little golf pencils. So there, there's been a lot of things that have been put in place in order to combat the pandemic. Gabe, did you have any other insider info to add? Well, yeah, you're absolutely correct. The one thing is that we're doing it in, on iPads instead of the, the glob pencils and the traditional uh, paper and pencil, uh, just because we want that information as fast as possible. Um, it's self-administered and obviously we, uh, workers have to wipe down the iPads and be extra careful with the COVID precautions. But yeah, early voting you know, has been a, a rising trend in recent years and it's important now just because we know that Biden supporters are more likely to vote by mail or vote early uh, versus Trump supporters who are uh, more likely to vote in person. So it's kind of um, forced us to do more exit polling in important states like Florida and Texas, Nevada, uh, to make sure we capture this accurate representation of voters. Great, thank you both. Um, I think we'll, we'll do one more question so that we we don't uh, cut through your time here. One um, hears of the quality of a poll. What do you believe goes into defining a poll's quality? So I, I think a lot of the things we discussed, um, you know, we'll have a pop quiz now. A lot of the things we discussed uh, in the crash course portion goes into recognizing the credibility and the quality of a poll. Um, you know, how was the poll conducted? Was it a random scientifically scientifically selected sample of the population under study? Do they, are they transparent? Does the pollster publish the uh, questions? Um, you know, publish how the questions were asked, publish the methodology, uh, how the data were weighted. All of those factors that we talked about should be transparent and readily available from the pollster. If they're not readily available, if they're just saying, hey, the, the race is 50 to 48, then they're, they're probably not a reliable source. That's great. Thank you. Uh, I think we're going to wrap it up there. Uh, so on behalf of the RUAA, I want to thank you, Ashley and Gabriel, both of you for being here with us tonight. I know I certainly learned a lot. Um, and I'm definitely going to take this, uh, this lesson into account in the next few days here and, and definitely in elections to come. And I want to wish you luck tonight, Ashley, uh, with the BBC and both of you luck on election night. I know you'll both be working in different capacities that evening. And um, just thank you again. And, and we'll see you soon and look forward to following your work. Have thank a great you. night, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Bye, everyone.